Uh, thank you, Sani, for praying. We have come to the fourth verse of uh, Romans chapter 15. I did uh, share a little bit about the fourth verse on <clears throat> Wednesday, but I was not happy with the... Uh, I didn't elaborate on that, and I wanted to... Go, it's a very powerful verse. I want to go back to it and study it and uh, see how we can apply in our lives. And here, uh, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 4, For everything written in, in the past were written, were written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And the past basically means the Old Testament. From the very beginning, whatever God spoke to his people, we study Old Testament, primarily because uh, we learn of God from the entire Bible. We understand his nature, how he deals with his people, how he dealt with them in Old Testament times. And we have to understand the Bible in its context and apply in our context. So everything in the Bible is written to teach us. Education for us to understand God, not just understand the word of God, but understand God through his word. And it goes on to say that through endurance, and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The word hope here is a word called elpida, which means expectation. Normally, the word hope is elpis in Greek, but here's elpida, which means expectation. When we go through difficult times, we need to endure. We need to have endurance only when we have difficult times. When we go through difficult times, we are able to endure to the encouragement of the scriptures. It was encouraged us to go through difficult times so that in those difficult times, we have expectation to come out of it. I'll give one example from the Old Testament time. In Psalm 119, verse 50, the psalmist says, My comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise preserves my life. He went through trials and suffering. He said, My comfort in those trials is your word. He could endure those trials because he's encouraged by the promises of God. And that actually some Bible says the promises. The promises preserve my life. And this psalmist used to meditate upon the promise. He used to meditate. It was 148. My eyes stay open to the words of night. They were meditating on promises. And therefore, we read the, all these verses in the Old Testament written down for us that we go to difficult times, to endurance and encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Scriptures always encourage us. God always builds us up. Let me give you one more example from the Old Testament. Why we read it in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 23rd chapter, 15 to 17, we read, when David was running away from Saul, because Saul wanted to kill him, and David could not retaliate because Saul was once God's anointed, and for the best years of his life, young youth, from probably from teenage life to 30 years, he was running. He was the fugitive. Only at the age of 30, he became king. The prime years of his life, 20 to 30, he must have been a fugitive in the wilderness. Saul pursuing him. And Bible says in this passage, 1 Samuel, 20 chapter, 15 to 17, while David was at Horesh, the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come to take his life. And Jonathan, son of Saul, went to David and helped David find strength in God. Jonathan, a friend of David, son of Saul, helped David find strength in the Lord. Not strength in himself, but in the Lord. What did he tell him? He told him, don't be afraid. My father will not lay a hand upon you. He will be king of Israel. I will be second to you. Even my father knows this. Now, whatever or rather, everything that Jonathan told David did not come true. Jonathan never became second to David when he became king. He had died before that. But something he told David was a reminder of what God had told Samuel a long time ago. When he unknown to David with oil, he be king of Israel. Being reminded of one statement of God, one promise of God was sufficient for David to find strength in God. One particular promise, being reminded of that. The king of Israel. How can David think how are going to kill him? Only God had told him he was going to be king. He probably forgot that. 
Colonel reminds him, don't be afraid. Your father will not lay a hand upon you. You're going to be king. And that statement helped David find strength in God. There's so many things in scripture, Old Testament, that encourage us. Yesterday I spoke about that. Compliments of God, I spoke, from God I spoke last night. If you, if you have time, if you not, didn't attend last night's message, go to YouTube and check it out. How God compliments us, not compliment, compliment. He gives us, says, says beautiful things about us in the Bible, Old and New Testament. Those things make us rise above difficulties. For everything in the past, we're going to teach us that through endurance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have expectation or hope. Not only that, there are also warnings in the Bible. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10 chapter, from verse 1 to 10, Paul writes about how when the Israelites came from Egypt, along the way they grumbled, they tested God, they ended in sexual morality, and they uh, sexual immorality, testing God, grumbling. There are four things they did actually. And uh, because of that, they died in the desert. They died in the desert because of grumbling, testing God, idolatry in, in, in the wilderness. And then after identifying those sins they committed along the way, in the 11th verse, Paul writes, these things occur to them as examples, written down as warnings for us. Warning for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come upon us. Fulfillment of the ages has come upon us. That fulfillment is Christ. For ages, people are searching, waiting for the Messiah to come. He's come to us. So in the same way, we should not continue in sin. Of course, today God won't send snakes if we grumble against him. Uh, in the Old Testament time, he sent snakes and they died because of grumbling. If God will send snakes today, uh, when Christians grumble, on Sunday morning you will find live snakes in the church and dead bodies in the church building. But thank God he's gracious. He's a gracious and compassionate God. And therefore, uh, let's understand that these are all examples for us and we learn from the entire Bible about God and how God expects us to live. The scriptures always encourage us. It has been my testimony, you know, your testimony also. And the Holy Spirit takes the Bible to encourage us that we have expectation, hope in difficult times. With that, let's go to the next verse, verse 5. May the God who gives us gives endurance and encouragement give a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ. May God give you endurance and encouragement. When you have to endure, we need encouragement. Same thing, same spirit is, uh, in the same spirit, God writes his words. Paul writes his words. God who gives you endurance and encouragement, give a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. Unity among the body of Christ is the heart of God. He wants us all to be united, to be loving each other. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this all men will know you, my disciples, if you love one another. You love one another. And when Jesus prayed to the Father in heaven, the essence of his prayer, the 17th chapter of John, is unity, oneness. And very interestingly, in the first century church, at least for some time, they were one mind and one spirit. Acts 4.32, they're all of one mind and one spirit. How can different people, different mindsets, different way of thinking, how can they be one mind and one spirit? It's possible. They were of one mind because probably they all sought the mind of Christ. When everyone seeks the mind of Christ, to have the mind of Christ, there will be a one mind. Christ's mind is one, it's not a divided mind. And the Apostle Paul exhausts the church in Philippi. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.5. And about himself and his co-workers, he says, 
in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, we have the mind of Christ. So we really want to apply this principle. Each one of us should seek the mind of God, the heart of God. That's the exhortation which Paul gave to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 3, 1, 2, and 3. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. The Christ is the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. The life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, whose life appears, you will appear with him in glory. Now, very interestingly, the Old Testament we read, at a time when people had gone away from God, the word of God was read. There were not many visions. The Lord spoke to Eli, the high priest in Shiloh, in 1 Samuel, 2nd chapter, verse 35. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do what is in my heart and my mind. Who will do what is in my heart and my mind. We are going to do what is in the heart and mind of God. You seek the heart and mind of God. And all of us can seek the heart and the mind of God. When we start doing that, then as, a, as an offshoot of that, as an expression of that, we will all be a one heart and one mind. It's possible. If it's not possible, God will not say, let them all be one. So here the wish of Paul for the churches. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus. So as you follow him, this will happen. Verse 6. So that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With one heart and mouth. What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. You all have one heart. We we'll all have one mouth. We speak what is in the heart. But Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 34, I think. Yeah, 34, 35, 36, we read. Abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Verse 35 says, the good man brings good things from the good sword up in his heart. Evil man brings evil, evil sword up in his heart. So when a heart is full of God's word, we'll speak God's word. From the fullness of heart, the mouth speaks. So here Paul says that let all be people with one heart and mouth. You may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our Christian vocabulary, uh, vocabulary entirely worshipping him, praising him, exalting him, glorifying him. For all of us start doing that, then spontaneously all the other things will vanish from our lives. Our talk will be godly talk. And this the desire of Paul for the church. He said, may God bless you in this man. That's why he, he writes to them about that. Verse 7. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you. In order to bring praise to God. Christ accepted us as we were sinners. While as sinners, he died for us. He has accepted us. We accept people. How does God deal with us? He accepts us as we are. Then he begins the process of transformation. He transforms us to be more and more like him. The Holy Spirit makes us more and more like Jesus. At the point of time we turn to Jesus, a veil covering a heart was removed. We can now understand scriptures. That veil still remained upon people, the Jews, who did not accept Christ as Savior. They can understand the old covenant. A veil covered their hearts. And Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter. He goes on to say about the Jews living during his time, even to this day, a veil covered their hearts. Their minds are made dull. For only in Christ, this veil is removed. 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter, 14, 15, 16. And whenever anyone turns to Christ, this veil is removed. In verse 18, he says, And we who the unveiled faces all reflect God's glory, are being transformed into his likeness 
with ever increasing glory which comes from the lord who is the spirit the word spirit there is capital s the holy spirit of god makes us more and more like jesus transformation comes from him mind transformation and life transformation first mind has to be renewed then life gets renewed so god accepted us as we were and then as we yield to him he changes us in the same way we accept people who are in the lord who have many difficulties they have sins don't condemn them yes we have to correct them for their good but don't reject anyone because god never rejected us he will never reject us psalm 94 was 14 god never rejects his people he will never forsake his inheritance he will never forsake his inheritance in the old testament time when joshua was supposed to enter the land of canaan around the israelites moses would not cross over joshua would take them across he was probably terrified and discouraged and god encouraged him through moses don't be terrified don't be discouraged lord god will be with you wherever you go in the book of deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6 we read god says i will never leave you i will never forsake you that statement of god reveals the nature of god his personality he never changes he will never leave us never forsake us that nature is applied new testament in different context totally different context god is same context is different context here is love of money so 13th chapter of hebrews was five writer writes keep your lives free from the love of money because god has said i will never leave you and never forsake you he will never leave us never forsake us now when look at this and then compare what jesus said on the cross my god my god why have you forsaken me we going to wonder god never forsake us what did jesus say that fact is he was forsaken that we will never be forsaken let me repeat that statement he was forsaken on the cross because our sins were on the cross that we after we turn to him will never be forsaken he said that on the cross to fulfill some 22 verse 1 put to fulfill prophecy my god my god why have you forsaken me he was forsook by the father for those six hours because god is so pure he can't look upon evil about 113 and because of his being forsaken for the six hours and again restored you and me have become god's people he shed blood on the cross and now because of that we have every promise of god for us he will never leave us and forsake us how wonderful to know how gracious god is the christ was forsaken that we will not be forsaken which means he is always for us nothing can separate us from his love and therefore since he has been so gracious towards us he must be gracious towards people accept them whose faith is weak in fact the 14th chapter began with that accept them whose faith is weak maybe at this point of time we are very strong in faith when he began we are very very uh, we are baby christians isn't it like newborn babies we craved spiritual milk and now we can take in solid food but people are not like that you don't give a baby chicken biryani you give baby milk slowly the baby gets strong and is able to eat solid food so in the body of Christ, there are many new believers there are baby christians there are mature christians we all have to be patient because love is patient in the book of corinthians first corinthians 13th chapter 4 to 8 talks about love the first description of love is love is patient we are patient with people accept them without one accept another just as christ accepted you so if i find difficult to accept people think of how christ accepted you he accepted us and then began the change in us to make us more and more like this so we must be people accept others 
and be instruments in them changing for the better. If you look at uh, Galatians 6 1, Paul writes, Brothers, if someone is caught up in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. Or be careful, you may be tempted. If you are spiritual, don't reject anybody. Never reject him. God never rejects us. We don't reject anybody. We are called to be builder of people. We build people up, not tear them down. If you're really spiritual, someone is caught up in a sin, help him come out of it. Be instrument of God in him being drawn out of that sin. Verse 8. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. He became a servant of the Jews. The word servant used here is diakonon. Diakonon means minister. Normally the word servant or slave is a word called dolos. It actually means slave. And um, in English Bible, very often we just find the word servant. It doesn't say slave, just servant. And the word is originally dolos. Here the word is diakonon, which means a minister. He came to minister to the Jews. He came to serve the Jews. Very often I share in the Zooms that when Christ entered the world, his physical life on this world, in this world was primarily for the Jews. Rarely ministered to Gentiles. Because that was his calling. His life. That's why he never went out of the boundaries of Israel. Geographical uh, border. He didn't go out. In a small child, they took him to Egypt. And he came back. After that, never went out of Israel. Palestine, as those days. So, minister to the Jews till his death. At the point of time he is crucified, when blood was shed on the cross, and after six hours on the cross, he dismissed his spirit. He gave up his spirit. 27 chapter of Matthew, verse 15. And next verse says, 50 verse verse, at that time, the curtain in the, in the temple tore into from top to bottom. Till that point of time, only the high priest would enter the most holy place. Only the high priest. There's a Jewish court, Gentile court. Outside, lepers are there. They can't come inside also. So when you enter the temple, outer court, outside, lepers, then Gentile court, then Jewish court, then the curtain, then holy place, and then the most holy place. And there's a curtain. Only high priest went there once in a year. When Christ dismissed the spirit after shedding blood, the curtain tore into from top to bottom, which means anybody can enter the most holy place, including the Gentiles. That's why when this lady brought her daughter to Jesus and the disciples, for her to be delivered of demons, the Lord tells the disciples, I have come only for the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew chapter 15, 24 to 26. And then she comes and begs Jesus for daughter to be healed. And Jesus tells her, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. And she says, even dogs eat the crumb that falls on the table. And he tells her, you've got great faith. In front of the disciple, he tells her, you've got great faith. The disciple, he told them once, you have little faith. Where's your faith? You have little faith. To this Gentile lady, he says, you have great faith. He made exception to the rule that he only came for Israelites. But after he was crucified, this grace became available to all people, including Gentiles. The next few verses, we're going to see how Gentiles have benefited from this grace. And today, all of us know that. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are one in Christ. So he was primarily a servant, minister to the Jews. He became a servant to the Jews, minister to the Jews. When he walked this earth. But thereafter, from the cross onwards, this grace became available for every human being in the world. Because 1 John 2.2 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, the sins of the whole world. 
and in Rome there are many Gentile Christians. Rome is a Roman. Uh, it's a Rome is actually uh, uh, there were some Jews, obviously, Jews who came to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, and they went back having seen the power of God upon the disciples. But the church in Rome must have been uh, in, uh, inhabited, not inhabited. Uh, you know, members of church would also be Gentile believers. And therefore, this address to these people to understand how because of the cross they become believers, they receive mercy, as we saw in 11th chapter of Romans, verse 32, is given mercy to all people. So he came for the primarily for the Jews, but thereafter from the death onwards for everybody. Okay. Uh, I, if I tell you that Christ has become a servant, a minister of the Jews, on behalf of God's truth, to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. So the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as written. Now, the following verses is fine. So many reference, which we'll talk about that on, on Monday. And all these verses talk about how Gentiles will be partakers of this grace of God. Prophesied in the Old Testament time. In spite of that, the Jews could not accept Gentiles becoming believers. God spoke to the patriarchs. In fact, the entire Old Testament, the law and the prophets point to Christ. The grace that will come through Christ. So he came to fulfill the promise made to the patriarchs. So the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. For his mercy. Going back to Romans 11.32. God has given all men over to disobedience. They have mercy on them all. So on Monday, Wednesday, uh, Monday, we're going to see the other verse. We go to each one of the verses. I thought I'd finish this today, but I went slowly today. Every verse is so important. And we're going to see how this grace to the mercy to the Gentiles was prophesied a long time ago. Some of them were blinded, the Jews. They were blinded. Why? Because they didn't give the life to Jesus during this time. So they are blinded. They couldn't understand. I'm going to see how they finally understood that today, Grace and mercy available for all people, every human being in the world. And Christ accepts us as we are and changes us. So we must accept other people, other believers, be instruments of change. Never condemn anybody, never reject anybody, but always build up people through our words and through our deeds. May God bless us. We'll carry on again on, on, on Monday. I hope to finish the 15th chapter by, by next Wednesday. And in fact, next week, I hope in three days to finish the uh, next two chapters, 15 and 16. Because 16 chapters basically greetings. But you go through it. What, uh, we won't fix the time. We'll just see how it goes and God will bless us. Amen. God bless you.